All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Sophie Seminar. Today it's our pleasure to have Professor Stefan Eigel from Chicago Booth and uh, Professor Stefano Giglio from Yale. Uh, you know, we will we will have about one hour. Uh, the first speaker, Stefan Eigel, will have 45 minutes and he will present when do cross-sectional asset pricing factors span the SPF. Um, this is the first time this paper is being uh, uh, presented to the public. So we really welcome uh, you know, everyone pr presenters to come over and present your most recent work uh, to this platform. And Stefano will have 15 minutes uh, for the discussion. And afterwards, we will invite audience to the post the seminar uh, discussion in the non-recorded session. All right, without further ado, uh, we're gonna welcome Steph Nigel to present. Because of the tech, some technical issues and we, we uh, not, uh, you know, he and I are gonna share the computer. All right. <laughs> Okay, so let me start by thanking Da Cheng for allowing me to use his computer. Uh, as it turns out, actually, for some reason this morning, both of my computers refused to work with a microphone. Uh, Zoom refused to work with a microphone, and so I'm using Da Cheng's computer now. Um, the paper I want to talk about today is uh, joint work with uh, Sergei Kozak, and uh, this paper is not quite finished yet. So this is, especially the empirical part at the end, still a uh, work in progress. The Cheng, why did why why is this not? Ah, yeah, okay, yeah, I got it, I got yeah. it. Yeah. No, uh, I need to use this just to. Uh, let's see. I this. You click this, and then you can use that too. Yeah. Okay, now it's worse. Okay, so um, what we are looking at in this paper is the connection between uh, stock characteristics and uh, the stochastic discount factor. There's, of course, a, you know, a huge literature on this, and uh, I'll tell you in a few seconds what exactly is uh, what we are bringing new to the table here. And so for this discussion, it's useful if we just define some basic notation right away. So when I'm going to talk about stock characteristics, what I have in mind is that we have a panel of n stocks, and each stock comes with j characteristics, and you can think of those as, you know, size, book to market momentum, but also many, many others, of course, uh, from the you know, factor zoo. And uh, there's also always going to be a column of one in the, in this characteristics matrix. And then we're, we're going to be interested in the relationship between these characteristics and excess returns, which I'm going to summarize in this in this vector Z. Um, and then we're going to talk about cross-sectional stock predictability, stock return pre predictability, which means something like, you know, the conditional uh, expected returns, conditional on these characteristics, um, have a linear relationship to these characteristics. And I'll say, say more about this linearity uh, in, in, in a few minutes. And then we're going to look at factor models. So what are characteristics-based factor models? These are factors that use the excess returns, combine them with the characteristics, and then construct some factors that one sticks into a, into a candidate uh, SDF. Okay, so this is sort of the, the setup. And there are three broad questions that we're interested in. And the first one has to do with a factor construction. If you look into the literature on characteristics-based factor models, there's a bunch of different uh, ways of constructing factors that researchers use. Um, so one of them uh, is, for example, uh, a sorting technique where you transform characteristics into bin indicators and then basically use these bin indicators to uh, uh, weight characteristics. This would be like the Pharma French 93 approach. Um, other studies, like, for example, one that uh, Sergei Kozak and Sri Santosh uh, uh, and I wrote uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uses the characteristics directly as weights. In fact, we actually used, uh, uh, you know, rank characteristics transformed into ranks directly as weights and apply them to the excess returns. And then there are studies that use cross-sectional regression slopes as factors. So from our French 2020 had this approach and uh, the well-known Barra factor model that practitioners use also has this kind of construction, where you regress excess returns in the cross-section on lag characteristics, and these slopes that you get in these cross-section regressions, they are themselves basically uh, factor, factor returns. And so we're going to call these sorts of factors, we're going to call them OLS factors. And you know, what's the objective of these reduced form factor models? It's basically to try to find factors that span the mean variance frontier or equivalently span, span the SDF. Uh, 
And uh, everything we're going to talk about today is going to stay within this reduced form factor model approach. So there's going to be nothing about what the economic motivation is for these factors, the you know economic reasons for risk premium and all that. We're going to stay purely within this reduced form factor model approach, trying to talk about you know do factors spend in mean variance from T or not, and then which conditions do they do it. Now, as we know, if you want to look for an, a mean variance efficient portfolio, you typically have to use information from the whole covariance matrix in order to construct that portfolio. And these methods, these factor construction methods, don't use it. And this brings up the natural question: you know, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for these approaches, um, these heuristic factor construction approaches, to actually yield factors that span the mean variance frontier? Yeah, so this will be the first part of of our analysis to look into these into these conditions. Now, the literature has already recognized that these heuristic factor construction methods are not perfect, and that factors that are constructed with these methods are contaminated with unpriced risks. And to fix this, there have been attempts to hedge these unpriced risks out of these uh, factors and then basically construct cleaner factors that are closer to spanning the mean variance frontier. And to do so without using the full, you know, the full covariance, ma covariance matrix and without having to invert uh, the full covariance matrix. Yeah? And uh, one recent example is the Daniel Muta, Rodka, and Santos paper. And at least, you know, empirically, these approaches seem to have some, some success. Uh, they manage to produce factors that have higher Sharpe ratios or closer to the to the mean variance frontier. Um, but what we actually don't know is, you know, what are the conditions under which these approaches actually work? And so this is the second question that we want to ask. What are these sufficient conditions for this, these kinds of hatching approaches to actually deliver factors that span the mean variance frontier? And then the third question has to do with dimension reduction. So in dimension reduction, one is asking, can we use information in J characteristics and basically compress this into a smaller number of you know uh, just k factors and again of course without having to invert uh, a j by j covariance matrix and uh, there are different approaches to this you know one is to just construct characteristics based factors and then do principal components analysis on these ret the returns of these factors um, the instrumented pca method of kelly et al is an al alternative and then kim uh, korajic and neuhiel have developed a method called projected PCA. So these are examples that that you know try to do this dimension reduction. Uh, and here too, we don't quite know you know what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for dimension reduction to actually be possible, and then for these methods to actually yield factors that spend in the inverse frontier. Yeah, so that's the third the third question we are we are looking at. Okay, so here's the outline. The first part will be about the conditions for heuristic factor construction methods to yield factors that span the SDF or the mean variance frontier. And we'll talk about factor hedging and uh, sort of an, an, an additional uh, development that we, we, we stumbled on, which is uh, to, to, to actually do hedging in multiple rounds to do iterated factor hedging. Then we'll go to dimensional reduction. Um, I probably won't have much time to talk about the uh, extensions we have on, on you know, conditioning down to unconditional moments and some thoughts on factor model testing. We'll have to see whether uh, I can get to this. And then maybe just a few words about empirics, but the empirics in this paper is really still work, work in progress. So whatever I show you there, you should take with a, with a grain of salt. This may change uh, in, in, in the next versions of the paper. Okay, so here's the setup. Um, I already mentioned to you what this characteristics matrix X is, and just remember that it always includes a column of one, and we assume it's observable uh, to the econometrician. And then everything we're going to do is going to be in terms of conditional moments, and we are going to do everything under knowledge of conditional moments. Uh, so the paper is not going to speak at this point, at least, about you know, sample moments, about testing, uh, and, and you know, sampling variation, all that. Uh, everything is going to be under known conditional moments. And um, the conditional moments that are relevant here are first the conditional covariance matrix of the excess returns of these n assets. And pay attention here that this conditional covariance matrix is conditioned on x and nothing else, right? So it, 
this is not not necessarily a strongly timering condition covariance matrix for example it you know it doesn't include the conditioning set doesn't include lags of you know past squared uh and cross products of returns and stuff like that it's all just conditional on x on these characteristics and then uh the conditional expected returns are collected in the in the vector mu t okay and then you know we know that once you have these conditional moments you could construct an sdf uh, that perfectly prices these uh these assets and the the weight vector bt in that sdf would just be the mean variance efficient portfolio weights yeah so this is that now let's go to factor construction so generically when people construct characteristics based factors there's some sort of weight matrix uh wt that weights these uh n asset returns into j uh characteristics factors uh and just in terms of notation we're going to use mu ft and sigma ft for the conditional moments of 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 these factor returns okay and now the question is under which conditions do different specifications of this weighting matrix wt produce factors that span the conditional mean variance frontier which alternatively means that we can write the sdf uh as as you know the in the in the way i've i've, I've shown here with uh with uh these specific weights for for these factors okay and so here's here's the the key assumption that you are starting with which is that there is a linear relationship between characteristics and conditional expected returns now at this at this conceptual level this is really not restrictive because you could think of xt as including you know nonlinear transformations and various expansions of characteristics um and you could also include uh you know for example interact characteristics with with time varying state variable variables with with time series variables so in principle you could make this uh you know very general now that said of course once you do an empirical application where you fix a, a certain set of characteristics then of course this assumption becomes substantive yeah because then then you have kind of pinned down what is excess but this is our, our our starting point uh we have in the paper some sections where we 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 ask you know what what one could do with uh, uh additional uh, with different assumptions uh instead of this this uh linear and x assumption um but uh for for the for the presentation here i'm gonna just focus on the the linear case okay and so just as a background this is not yet uh an you know kind of important result but just as a background as a starting point uh our pro proposition one shows how you can express the sdf in that in that uh in that case so if you have this linearity between characteristics and conditional expected returns then there's always an sdf that perfectly prices these assets and the, the sdf can be written in a way that is kind of interesting which is um the, you know if you pick a particular matrix x which is just a basically a rotation matrix you can you can you can pick different different sts here uh, but if you pick a particular st then you can express these factors uh, that span the sdf as gls cross-sectional regression slopes so this is related to this idea of constructing factors via cross-sectional regressions but it's a GLS cross-sectional regression and it involves inversion of the conditional covariance matrix. If one constructs factors like this, then it turns out that the betas are exactly equal to the characteristics. Yeah. Okay, we just thought this is sort of a useful starting point because it also speaks to this uh, long debate about uh, you know, uh, factors versus characteristics-based asset pricing that, that uh, has been going on for two decades or so. Uh, this case really nicely illustrates that there is really uh, no economic difference between just regressing returns on some characteristics matrix x with a linear regression which is what people have called characteristics based asset pricing and by applying a factor pricing model that has factors constructed based on x because we know here that we can always construct this gls factor uh model and that perfectly uh, matches these conditional expected returns and so a whole trace of this of characteristics versus covariances isn't really you know economically meaningful and doesn't have economic content if you use factors that are gls factors then 
you know, they perfectly explain conditional expected returns, so there's no difference. If you use factors that are not GLS factors, well, then they can fail to explain conditional expected returns. But this is basically due to an ad hoc misspecification uh, by not using information from the conditional covariance matrix, right? So it's not clear that this has any a wedge between these approaches or has any economic meaning. Okay, but now to uh, the substance. So again, suppose this assumption one, this linearity between characteristics and conditional expected return holds, then one can show that these factors Ft here are conditionally mean variance efficient if and only if certain conditions on the, on the covariance matrix hold. And so you can see the sigma t here at the bottom. You basically need this structure that you can decompose the covariance matrix into two components where one component is related to these characteristics and the other one is not in the sense that this u matrix uh, the, the, the vectors of this matrix are orthogonal to the, the, the vectors of these characteristics. Um, and so this covers several different types of factor construction methods, depending on what you use for this rotation matrix ST. So if you, you see at the bottom, if you make this ST equal to X prime X inverse, then you're basically getting OLS factors, like in the Pharma French paper. And this should be Pharma French 2020, not 2018 here. And so this basically tells you that for the OLS factors of Pharma French to span the SDF, you need to have this, this orthogonality between the columns of X and the, the columns of U here. Okay, so only in those special conditions on the covariance matrix, these OLS factors actually span the SDF. Now, looking a little bit closer at, 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 this, at this, um, these conditions, um, actually, no, let me first show an illustration and then, then we can uh, talk about uh, some you know more meaning we can get out of this. Yeah? But here's just a, a illustration for of of the sufficiency uh, uh, of this result of this condition. So if you think about the sigma t matrix and with this condition mu prime x equals zero holding, and now you think about how covariances between excess returns and factors are going to look like. Well, that's just the covariances of excess returns and factors are just the conditional covariance matrix multiplied by the factor weights. And you can see that when the covariance matrix has this structure that this proposition requires, then these conditional covariances of stocks with factors basically boil down to something that's linear in X. And then if you form betas out of these covariances, then you basically get back to having betas that are exactly equal to X. In fact, the risk premia turn out to be exactly equal to this phi vector, which shows which comes from this linear relationship that we assume between conditional expected returns and the axis. Okay, and then you put it all together and you know it always um, explains conditional expected returns. But the, the key is here basically that th this, this condition on the covariance matrix ensures that when you form covariances of excess returns with factors that only stuff related to X remains there and is not contaminated by, by other things that are unrelated to X. And you know, this shows sufficiency, but the, the, the necessity is more involved. So I, I don't have an sort of intuitive way of, of, of showing this. Okay, now thinking a little bit more about what this means, this actually tells us some useful things. So for example, uh, including more characteristics in factor construction should make this condition more likely to hold, right? Because you can imagine you have a small number of characteristics and there's maybe still something related uh, remaining in this U matrix that's related to, to your characteristics. So the condition doesn't hold. But if you can find characteristics, additional characteristics that, that span that stuff in U that's related to your characteristics, then you can basically uh, make that condition hold, right? So, so having having more characteristics is probably uh, going to help. It also tells us that adding characteristics can be useful even if these characteristics do not contribute to expected return vari variation, right? Because just the fact that a characteristic is basic, basically helps you to clean up 
the covariance matrix and helps you get closer to this condition holding uh, should help these factors to span the SDF. Yeah? And so that's something that we also want to investigate a bit more empirically. We haven't done this yet so far, but um, the literature typically focuses mostly on characteristics that contribute to expected return variation, but there seems to be scope for improving factor models by also including characteristics that just help with the, this covariance condition, uh, even without necessarily contributing to expected return variation. Okay, so just uh, to illustrate this a bit more, here's an example with two uh, characteristics. Suppose the, the characteristics you observe are this, this uh, vector x, just one characteristic, and another characteristic y. Um, and I make this C matrix in the, in the covariance matrix diagonal. And I assume that uh, if we have both of these characteristics in our characteristics matrix, then this condition u prime x equals zero holds. Yeah. But now the question is, what happens if you omit this y uh, from the characteristics when you construct factors? But let's let's first look at what how the covariance matrix looks like when we form uh, in, in, in under these assumptions that I have just written up. Right. So now we have the covariance matrix having two components: one basically related to x, one related to y, and then some stuff that's left over uh, in mu. In, 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 uh, in these, these, these U matrices uh, and the, the quadratic form related to this U matrix. Okay. And uh, let's now make the assumption that only X is relevant for expected returns, right? So you can write conditional expected returns uh, perfectly as a function of X. But the covariance condition that we assumed above holds only if both characteristics are used in factor construction, right? Because think about if you now were to compute, you know, form a factor that's only using x, but not y, and you want to know what the covariance is of this factor that you constructed based on x and excess returns, right? So this basically now involves like post multiplying the, uh, or, or pre multiplying, doesn't matter, uh, the, the covariance matrix with x. And you can see there, there's now not only the x part remaining, but since x is correlated with y, there's also going to be the y part there. And the y part is basically a distortion. Okay, so here's how the factor covariances look like. If you just use x to construct uh, construct factors, you have the first part, the, 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 the part, part that you would like to have, basically. Uh, but there's also the second part, this unpriced risk contamination that's coming from x not being orthogonal to y. OK, and as a consequence, these factor covariances are not going to align with x and, and, and in the cross-section. And this gives, gives rise to pricing errors. OK, now if, if yt was observable, we could just include it in factor construction. But the practical problem typically will be that there could be some characteristics like this floating around that we actually don't observe. Yeah. They, they matter for the covariance matrix. They are correlated with the characteristics that we do observe, uh, but we can't directly observe. And this is now where these hedging methods come, come in. Right? So the hedging methods that people have developed to try to get rid of these unpriced uh, risk contamination is basically now trying to use at least some information from the covariance matrix to effectively back out this unobservable y, and having done so, then basically improving these factors uh, and making this condition in our proposition two uh, holding, right? Once you have cleaned cleaned up these factors. In this case. Okay. Now, of course, you know, in 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 principle, there's no need. If if you had really perfect knowledge of these condition moments, there wouldn't be any need to go through this, you know, construct imperfect factors and then hedge them and so on uh, approach because you could just construct the GLS factors by inverting the conditional covariance matrix. But in, in practice, of course, we know there are lots of issues with, with, with uh, this approach. And uh, for, for this reason, these hedging factor, th these hedging approaches try to come up with improved factors by using only 
partly you know part of the information in the in the in the covariance matrix. Okay, um, and what where we come in, come in is is by basically asking well for these approaches that people have proposed in the literature, it's actually not clear under which conditions they work and 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 why they work and how. Yeah? And so this is what I want to answer. And uh, this may also be of interest. The results we have on in this part of the paper kind of connect to an older literature in econometrics from the early 80s, where people have asked, you know, can we construct partially GLS estimators that don't use the full covariance matrix and inversion of the full covariance matrix, uh, but just basically partial information from the uh, covariance matrix to get uh, uh, basically uh, estimators that are equivalent to GLS under certain conditions. Okay, so we're going to look at the Daniel et al. Uh, approach, and the way this works is as follows. Yeah? You start with your heuristic factors. So this could be the OLS factors, for example, of my French. And then you look at the covariance of these factors with accessory tones. And then you take the residual of these covariances with regards to X. And this is basically what isolates the unpriced risk exposure, right? Remember, under our assumptions, X spans in a cross section conditional expectatory tones. So if there's something in these covariances that's unrelated to X, that's basically unpriced risk exposure. Okay. And now you construct hedging factors where you basically take these residualized covariances and you use them to weight stocks into portfolios. Now you get factors that are basically pure unpriced risk factors. And now you look at, well, how do stocks co-vary with these pure unpriced risk factors? And once you have these covariances, you basically take your original weights and you residualize them with regards to those covariances with these hedging factors or with these pure unpriced risk factors. And that basically removes now unpriced risk exposure and gives you hedge factor weights. And then you use, basically use these hedge factor weights as your, as your, as your factors to construct your factors. Okay, and so here's uh, the result we have on this. These are sufficient conditions. So far, we haven't been able to uh, figure out you know, whether these conditions are also necessary. They might be, but you know, we're not sure. So this, so far, this is all just sufficient. Um, so hedge factors are going to be conditionally mean variance efficient if in the covariance matrix, you can basically take this u omega u prime component that we talked about earlier, and you can de decompose this into two parts where the second part related to this E matrix is basically unrelated. These E vector, these vectors in E are unrelated to the characteristics. Um, the E vectors are also un un unrelated to the vectors, the column vectors in V. But this, these V, these, these column vectors in V, they can be related to characteristics. So we do not need to rule out that they are unrelated to characteristics. So what this basically means is that we have made this covariance, this, these conditions on the covariance matrix weaker because now we can allow for uh, J vectors in this V matrix showing up there that are related to these characteristics, that are correlated with these characteristics. Yeah. And so this is basically uh, why these heuristic factor hedging approaches might actually work because they allow to basically weaken the condition on, on, on the covariance matrix that needs to hold uh, for the factors then to span the mean variance frontier. Okay. And um, we can also look at this in our two characteristics example. I don't quite have time to uh, walk through it in detail, but the upshot is that basically when you remember we had these two characteristics, the original factors are constructed only based on X. And then this, this Y characteristic was basically left there in the covariance matrix and was dis distorting the factors by introducing unpriced risks. And what one can show now in this example is that once you go through this, these steps of this hedging approach, uh, what you're basically left with is uh, first 
you know, you get hedging factors where stocks covariances with hedging factors exactly isolate this unobservable y vector. And then once you do the uh, residualizing of the factor weights with regards to these covariances with hedging factors, then you basically end up with uh, hedging he hedged factor weights that take out from X that component that is related with Y, right? And this now gives you basically the, the, perfect, the perfect factor because you now you have eliminated that part of X that creates that, that, uh, that distortion uh, through its correlation with, with Y. Okay, and then as a consequence, Stocks covariances with these hedge factors are, are are proportional to x, and then they are also proportional to uh, conditionally expected excess returns. Okay. Now, one thing we realized when we looked at this is that there's actually no reason now to stop after one round of hedging. Right. One can repeat that procedure uh, and just use now these hedge factors and again do a hedging round. Uh, just to repeat that entire procedure that we talked about. And you can do this in principle multiple times. And so what that happens now is that each additional hedging round is going to use additional information from the covariance matrix. And each round allows for basically J additional components in that, in that conditional covariance matrix that are correlated with, with XT. Yeah? So successive rounds of hedging are going to weaken the conditions on the covariance matrix that needs to hold for these factors to spend an invariant frontier. And so here's just a conjecture. We haven't proven this, but with you know known moments, it seems likely that this would then converge to the GLS factors uh, if you do an infinite round number of, of, of rounds of uh, actually wouldn't have to be infinite, but if you do you know a high enough number of rounds of of uh, iterating on this hedging procedure. Okay. Of course, in practice, one is going to work with estimated moments. And so uh, you could actually make it worse by doing a hedging round because you're bringing in estimation noise. And so empirically, it's also sort of an interesting question what sort of the optimal number of hedging rounds is here. Okay. And then the, the, uh, the third part now is dimensionality reduction. Um, and this basically now asks, you know, are there conditions on the conditional covariance matrix and also on this expected return relationship to the characteristics that allows one to summarize the pricing information from J characteristics based factors into a smaller number of K uh, factors. And again, you know, without having to invert the full covariance matrix or, and also actually without having to invert even a J by J. Uh, covariance matrix. Okay, and so at this general level, it's in a way very simple. What needs to hold is that everything I have told you so far with regards to X, both for conditional expected returns and for the conditional covariance matrix, basically has to hold for some linear combination of X. So if I take X and mul multiply it with a uh, this matrix, this J by K matrix Q that forms linear combinations of the columns of X and makes it lower dimensional, then everything I've told you earlier with regards to X needs to hold with regards to X times Q uh, for some Q. Yeah? And the question then is, of course, you know, in practice, how can one find that, that Q? Right to actually be able to do that dimensional reduction empirically, uh, finding that linear combination of characteristics that you want to use when you construct when you construct these factors. And so it turns out that one can easily find that Q um, by using principal components analysis, and different methods that people have used actually correspond to different normalizations that pin down certain rotations of Q. So for example under the normalization that Q prime Q is the identity and uh, lambda T, let me just show you what, what lambda T was. Uh, this was uh, in, in the first part, first term in the conditional covariance matrix, you can see this lambda T matrix. So if that one is diagonal, uh, 
and Q prime Q is identity, then you can recover QT from a, you know, principal components analysis of the conditional uh, covariance matrix of the all S factors. And uh, what I've showed you here on the left-hand side of this equation is the conditional covariance matrix of all S factors. And uh, one can easily see that under the assumptions about the conditional covariance matrix in the previous corollary, that just boils down to and simplifies down to just Q lambda Q prime. Yeah. And so uh, where these Qs are, are going to be the eigenvectors uh, of that factor covariance matrix. And it turns out under these assumptions, these Qs that you're getting and the factors that you're getting, this is basically equivalent to the IPCA factors of, of Kelly, Kelly. So basically doing principal components on these all S factor returns gives you the same result as going through the IPCA uh, procedure where they estimate these, uh, these, uh, these, these factor weights in an iterative procedure. If you pick a different normalization, so if we say instead of Q prime Q identity, we say Q prime X prime X Q is equal to the identity. And again, lambda T is diagonal. Then you can get QT from a principal component analysis of univariate factors. So that, that just use the characteristics directly as factor weights. If these characteristics have been orthonormalized. Okay. And this then turns out to be equivalent to the projected principal components approach of Kim et al. Okay. And I, uh, I also want to emphasize that these, these results that we have on the dimension reduction, they are necessary and sufficient, right? So this is different from the hitching. Piece. So the way we see this is that there's actually a great deal of similarity in reasonably provoked methods that at the first look might see seem you know quite different uh, but once you drill down into the conditions that make these methods work then under these conditions they are actually very similar okay Just the time. um let me jump over the conditioning but let's say let me say one word on on testing um so one thing one might ask, and well, how should we, you know, test a, a factor model? So let's say we have the OLS factor model, and uh, if you remember under our results, if these conditions on the conditional covariance matrix hold, then factor betas are going to be equal to the characteristics matrix, right? So characteristics are equal to to factor betas, and so there one might say, well. If you want to test a factor model, this should be really easy then, because if betas are equal to characteristics, then we can just plug in directly, you know, the characteristics for the factor betas in a in a you know factor model relationship, and then just check whether basically characteristics times average factor returns are equal to the average uh, excess returns. Mm -hmm. And I just want to emphasize here that you don't want to do that because uh, that's not a test of the factor model. By substituting in betas equal to characteristics, you're basically already assuming that this covariance condition holds. And this is basically the only way in which the model could fail, right? And so the question that one should ask is, um, are these are conditional betas on these factors actually equal to characteristics? Empirically, they might be different if that condition on the covariance matrix doesn't hold. But you don't want to just plug it in because if you plug it in, then you're basically just recovering uh, the assumption that we started with, which is that conditionally expected excess returns are linear in characteristics, and, and so uh, that's that's the only thing that you're basically you know testing if you're plugging in characteristics directly as betas. Okay, so. Then uh, finally, let, let, let me say a few words about the empirical analysis that we started with. Um, as I emphasized earlier, this is still work in progress. And so this part of the paper might still expand and also change uh, quite a bit uh, in, in, in future iterations. 
But um, you know, one question that we want to look into is how close do OLS factors or maybe some other you know rotations of of factors get to conditional mean variance efficiency? And uh, ideally, one would want to compare this to you know GLS factors, which are mean variance efficient. But of course, with sample moments, that's not going to work because we don't want to invert a, a huge n by n conditional covariance matrix. Um, but what what can do is now to to get kind of closer to this is to look at whether hedging these factors gives you gains in terms of the sharp ratios. And as we discussed earlier, there's no reason to start stop after one round of hedging. One can actually do multiple rounds of hedging, and then look at you know what sort of the maximum sharp ratio that you can get from uh, hedging these factors. And if you can improve the sharp ratio a lot by hedging these factors. This basically tells you that the original factors are not very close to uh, being mean variance efficient because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get this gain from, from hedging these unpriced risks. Okay. Um, and what we can also ask is empirically, you know, how different are actually in practice these different dimensionality reduction methods? And so this is also something uh, that we want to speak to. Uh, we are so far using data for 27 characteristics. Um, we are excluding microcaps and the sample period is from the early 70s to the to you know last year. And in exercises where we do out of sample analysis, we basically use the time period until 2005 as the estimation window and then uh, 2005 and later as the evaluation window. Okay, so let me just show you one result that we have so far on this gain from hedging. Uh, so this shows you if you let's let's focus on the leftmost uh, uh, point on the x-axis. If you start just using a one-factor model, and we do this for all these different characteristics, just always as a one-factor model, and then we ask, can you improve the sharp ratio if you do hedging? And it actually turns out there for one factor. One round actually doesn't empirically improve it, but if you do two rounds, three rounds, four rounds, you get a pretty big sharp ratio improvement. Yeah. Um, but then if you give your, give your factor model more factors, so you go to the right in that chart, you can see that these improvements from uh, hedging get much smaller. And I think this is consistent with what I told you earlier, which is that if you include a lot of characteristics to begin with in your factor model, it's much more likely that this covariance condition holds and your factors are already mean variance efficient. Okay. Um, and I forgot to, to say this, all of this is out of sample. So this is the sharp ratio improvement in the out of sample, out of sample period. But um, I'm out of time now, so let me uh, conclude here. Um, I've shown you that, you know, heuristic factor models, they're kind of useful because they avoid the need to know the co conditional covariance matrix, but they hold, they, they span the mean variance frontier only under certain conditions on that covariance matrix. Yeah. Um, and we talked about you know, when this is more likely to hold and so forth. Um, and I also showed you some conditions under which uh, dimensionality reduction is possible. I guess I'll, I'll just stop here and I look forward to Stefan's comments. All right, thank you. Excellent, so uh, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Stefan, for for clear uh, presentation. I had the privilege of a live uh, one-on-one -on -one presentation here. I'm sure audience will find it loud and clear as well. So uh, we're very happy to have uh, Stefano Giglio uh, to to discuss this paper. All right. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to discuss today. Um, okay. So I'm going to start with a brief review and then give a few comments uh, to Stefan uh, and and Sergi. So. Um, the, the the kind of big picture here is that you know there's a big effort in trying to to find uh, a return based STF which is basically the same as a tangency portfolio. That's obviously important for research because we want to understand what how does the STF look like, and of course it's also important uh, in the industry. So that's actually very easy to do if you are in a small dimension and static environment, right? You just take a covariance matrix, you invert it, you compute conditional means, and uh, you know that's that's an easy task. So what the literature has been kind of really thinking about were two main uh, issues that are, uh, they are somewhat linked. One is that the world is not static. And so, you know, conditional means and conditional expect uh, and conditional risks are changing over time. We need to figure out a way to, to track that. Uh, 
Um, and then the second one is uh, that there's a large dimensionality of the set of portfolios or assets we can use, which makes, you know, uh, even once you account for this time variation in, uh, in risk and risk exposures and, and expected returns, you know, it's still kind of hard to, to do that, um, the optimal portfolio, because you, you will end up uh, overfitting in some. And so basically, there's been many, many uh, papers in the last many decades to try to tackle these two issues. And you know what's common to basically all of the different approaches that have been proposed in the literature has been one that you know sorting into characteristics is useful because it makes risk exposure stable, right? So that's one. The second is that there's a link between the characteristics that predict returns and those that drive risks. So you know we can kind of uh, be, the literature has been basically mostly focusing on the effort of finding characteristics that predict returns with the idea that those characteristics will also drive risk. Otherwise, you have like basically an arbitrage. That's kind of the APT, APT intuition. But, you know, as Stefan points out here, you know, these are probably not the only characteristics that matter because you might have unpriced uh, risks. And then finally, uh, you can have, uh, uh, you know, you have the issue of kind of large dimensionality, which can be solved in many other, in many, using many specific tools. For example, use PCS. Um, okay, so then, you know, these are kind of the ideas that the literature has produced. In practice, there's actually, you know, there's been different degrees of kind of formal justification for you know, using all these methods. So for a long time, effectively, we've been using what, you know, what you can call heuristic approaches, which is just say, you know, I'm going to use this approach, I'm going to do this, you know, nonlinear source based on this, this particular uh, procedure, without really asking many questions, or, you know, under exactly what situation that's justified. I think more recently has been more of a push in a, of writing down an actual model, a statistical model, and basic, basically saying, you know, my procedure is justified using that model. You know, um, Stefan has a paper doing that. I have a paper doing that. Brian has a paper doing that. These are different ways to say, you, you know, you write down a model uh, and, you know, this model applies to this particular set of portfolios and using the model, I tell you what's the optimal way to do, you know, the dimension reduction, the sorting and so on. Okay. So what does this paper do? This paper basically is a uh, is an effort to kind of link and systematize all these different approaches and really ask the question, which I think is very important of, you know, all these different approaches, under which conditions do they all give the same results? And, you know, if they give different results, under which conditions, you know, some work and some do not work. One thing that, which I think is very nice about this paper is that in a sense, it's the, the existing literature was starting from a particular specific factor model. Okay, or in your stock model, the link to factor, but you know, there was a very specific PGP written down in the model, and then building the way up to what's the optimal way to deal with, op, you know, the mean balance frontier, the mean balance for the optimal portfolio, given that structure. This paper kind of goes from the top down. It says, look, let me just write the most general, okay, not, not the most possible, general, a very general specification without assuming a factor structure. And then, then we can talk about the various conditions. Okay, and I think that's useful because obviously it embeds much more generality. Uh, it can, you know, it can handle also situations where you don't have a factor structure for whatever, for whatever reason. And so I think that's a very useful uh, approach. I think it's an important step forward uh, in understanding how all these methods relate to one another. And I have the hope that it can provide uh, researchers with a useful intuition of how exactly you want to proceed, right? Because if you know what are the conditions that, will, that you need to satisfy, you may decide to, to orient your empirical analysis in different ways. To give you one example, once you see the algebra is very clear that, you know, if you're worried that there are some kind of missing characteristics or this omitted you thing, then you want to use as many characteristics as you can, right? That, that's very clear form of justification for using a saturating some sense of space of characteristics, okay? So I think it's a great paper. I think it's really important for anybody who wants to use uh, these tools. So, you know, as you can see, as you see from Stemma's presentation, the paper has a lot of like results, uh, and many of them are, are basically very, uh, very nice uh, linear algebra results. I'm not going to review them in detail. We'll review one in detail just to give you a flavor of the intuition. But I want to think about kind of teasing out the main ideas of the of the project in some sense. So the first main idea is basically even if you don't assume a factor model, really, what you need to think about when you're using you try to look for a tangency portfolio and you have information, a bunch of characteristics is basically what you're leaving out. Now, when, you, when you're thinking in these general terms and you're not assuming really a factor structure about you, you're leaving out, then it's kind of, a, you know, it's kind of, you need to really think about what is the nature of this U-turn that you're leaving out. 
Okay, I personally find it easier to think in terms of factor models. So for me, that's easy to think of that as based on a price factor. But again, the, the methodology is more general. It could accommodate other situations. So that's one idea. The other idea is, is that, you know, why are we using characteristics? Because it they help us find observable sources of common variation. And this is, if you want, this is where the paper is talking about the, the, the fact that you can actually get to these observable parts in many different ways. You can do univariate sorts. You can do multivariate sorts. You can do, you know, other things. And so the, basically it just says, look, Ultima, we have some characteristics under certain, certain conditions. It doesn't really matter in population how you get to extract the information. We get all, we squeeze out all the information we have, we can about this observable part. And then the question is, when is this sufficient? What do I need to assume about the part that is left out? Could be, for example, you don't need to worry about that because maybe what's left out is completely diversifiable. There is no common variation that remains once you build your, 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 your optimal portfolio that's gone. Or it could be that magically, right, the tangency portfolio happens to put zero weight on these unpriced factors, and that's also optimal. If neither of the condition holds, you know, if you're within a factor model and neither of these conditions holds, then, uh, then you, have, you have a problem because you, you have basically unpriced variation that's going to make your uh, factor model noise. And so, and, and finally, I want to point out that an important uh, addition to the, of the paper is the fact that, you know, it, it kind of within this very general context, it formally analyzes this uh, Daniel and Cotter's paper, which is a way to get around the fact that, you know, we may have limited information and characteristics, so we can, we can get some way towards finding this kind of missing part of the team. Okay, so that's my general review of the paper. I just want to kind of give you one slide on one example formally, okay, because I think it's useful to to understand really what the paper is doing. So we are in a condition, in a situation where we know mu t. So the expected returns are, are given. If you also knew sigma t, which is the covariance matrix of return, you're done. You can find a tangency portfolio directly. Uh, if you don't know sigma t, then you know, uh, then you, you kind of need, you can think of it as saying, this is the part that can squeeze out because I observe characteristics xt. And this is a pretty general form of what I can squeeze out. And you know, mathematically, the result boils down to, well, I my tangency portfolio will working only on xt, only using xt will be fine as long as xt is orthogonal to ut. And um, here, you know, you, this part is the part I don't observe. And to give an intuition of what's going on, you know, what do we mean by this xt ut uh, is equal to zero? One way to think about this is that one possibility is that ut is completely diversified, is asymptotic noise, right? Asymptotic noise then XT is going to really be the weights of a diversified portfolio. That part is going away. It could also be the UT as a factory. Okay, you can think of then UT as the loadings of this factor. And then basically, the, my way to interpret it is that it just has to happen that because your tangency portfolio is going to be a long short portfolio, it just happens to have no exposure to this residual part. Okay, and then the question is why would that happen by magic? And you know, it probably is not going to happen by magic. And so you're going to need to find a way around that. Okay, so I think. This is kind of, to me, that's the, 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 the intuition of the paper. Now, I'm going to skip the review of the empirical part because I don't have a lot of time and because in any case, it's kind of still working progress. So I just instead want to get to kind of four, four, a few comments on the paper. The first comment is really about exposition, is that I think that on the one hand, there's a very nice generality of the paper of saying, you know, I don't need to assume that the UT is a factor structure. It could be very general. It could have a network that actually does not yield to a factor structure. Um, and on the other hand, it's actually much easier to interpret things within a context of a factor structure, right? So what is UT? Well, UTs are basically loading on price risks. And so I think that on the one hand, I think the paper can give a little more intuition based on the factor models, like these two examples, it was useful. I think, you know, this idea that this XT UT equal to zero would just mean that I happen to have zero exposure to this, you know, unpriced factor. That was not entirely clear to me until it took me a while to actually get there, that that was the idea. And, uh, and so on the one hand, I think you can use a little more of the factor model to explain the intuitions. On the other hand, it would be kind of actually really cool to use this in a context which doesn't have a factor structure. Maybe you can figure out some network kind of application that doesn't yield directly a factor structure. That I think will kind of really push why this is useful to not have to work within factor models. So that's a really expositional uh, question. The second question, the second comment I have is really that on the, you know, why this generality is nice it's not entirely clear to me how you can actually then go to the data really without a factor structure. Why? Because if you want to do inference, you want to go to the data and do kind of find a sample statistic, studies, statistical properties of this, it's very hard to do it without imposing a DGP, 
right? And so, you know, we know how to work statistically with DGPs are specified as factor models, everything which is non-factor structures is much more complicated to work with. And so, uh, you know, especially if you think of high dimensionality, that's in, you know, introducing another layer of complications, which are already hard to deal with within factor models. And so, uh, so on the one hand, I think that it's, it's you, you know, I think ultimately maybe we need to say something more about inference. And uh, I think doing that without a factor structure will, will be complicated. But another side of this is that in a sense, if you only focus on population, you're gonna kind of naturally ignore a lot of interesting issues they are important in practice. For example, think about all this debate about weak factors, right? If, if weak factors don't really make sense in population, okay? Either the factor is there or is not there. If weak factor is about the ability of recovering in the data. And so in a sense, all this kind of literature on, you know, on factors or on the weak factors is kind of has no bite. There's no difference really in population between all these methods. So I think it would be nice to be able for the paper to be able to say about something about recovery of these factors in the real world. Again, maybe it's for another paper, okay? Then you have, you know, it's, it's, an, it's one step down the research agenda. But the other side of this is, again, it would be kind of cool if you could say something, you know, in situation, but it's not a factor structure. Maybe there is something about the inference you can say, which is also general, the kind of mirrors the generality of your, of your approach. Okay, so step three, uh, comment three is about conditional information. So uh, this idea that you can build the, so this, this idea, uh, you know, Stefan mentioned this in the presentation. I want to kind of really focus on one aspect of that, which is that this idea that you know we can go beyond characteristics and you can compute conditional covariances basically of stocks with factors, and from there we squeeze out more information than in characteristics, is you know simple to think about in population, right? Because in population we know the conditional covariances. Now, of course, we you know in a sense we have to assume that we don't know them fully, right? Otherwise, you just invert sigma. And so there's a bit of like internal kind of dissonance here, which is, you know, you know, it's not entirely clear that you can actually implement this in a, in a proper way if you don't actually know the conditional covariance, which is why, you know, the, your, uh, Daniel Hall paper and, he, and Stefan's paper, they use rolling windows to get extract this information because it's kind of a middle way to actually deal with this, with this problem. So, but rolling windows is not that, that pleasant in some sense because you, it's difficult to make inference with that. And then, you know, I worry that, you know, as you go down this iterate the runs way, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to estimate more and more and more pieces of this conditional covariance. And then you wonder, you know, might just, is that actually equivalent at the end of the day to just estimate if you're rolling windows, you know, this conditional covariance matrix and, uh, and then just, uh, and then just using finite time to perform that way. So, you know, in some way, in some way, the information about this conditional covariance matrix needs to come from some, and, you know, getting from iterated runs of these covariances of these rolling windows, I worry is getting us in a territory where it's not that different ultimately than just in, you know, estimating the entire covariance matrix. And I think that's the link that you can explore uh, in greater detail. Okay, the other side of this is rather than going that, that, that direction, you could potentially just say something maybe simpler if you assume that this, you know, this residual part of U is actually constant over time. And then you don't need to, you can at least do the algebra of how does it work if you fully can estimate this U from basically full sample estimation or equivalently in population, okay? But I think it would be kind of nice to be able to say more, something slightly more formal about this, this, this procedure. And then my last comment, I'm right on time. My last comment is, is that, you know, there's actually one thing that we'll be curious about because I worked on that, um, which is that the, the goal of this paper is to record the entire SDF, right? For some purposes, you don't need the entire SDF. So for example, in a paper with a Chang, what we are trying to look is to find the risk premium of a non-tradable factor G, let's say inflation, okay? And you know, for that purpose, you actually don't care about the entire SDF. You only care about the part that relates to GT. So in a sense, I think for these purposes, it seems to me you can, you can weaken the condition of what you actually need because the part that is kind of irrelevant for GT that could be actually contaminated by the GT, we don't really care about that. So that seems like a, a, another kind of potential application you can use of this technology. Of exactly what under what condition you can do this kind of partial record. All right, I know I went a little fast, but I'm right on time. I think it's a great uh, framework to systematize our understanding of all these different methods. I think it's very useful for people to really think, you know, what should I be doing in practice? And uh, and uh, and I think it's a must read for anybody that works in this space. Thank you for asking me to to discuss the paper.
All right, thank you very much for, for your insightful discussion. And uh, Stefan, you have uh, maybe a few seconds to respond. Yeah, so let me just thank Stefano for great comments. I, I agree basically with everything uh, that you said, Stefano. Uh, I guess it's just a question of how much can we you know, address within this paper. There's clearly you know, more, more uh, to be done, uh, but uh, I basically agree with all of these. Uh, these are great questions. All right, so. All right, good. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the discussion. And uh, so now we are closing the uh, the recorded session. Uh, for the rest of the audience who are interested in joining a discussion with uh, with us, so please accept our invitation. Uh, so you should be receiving it right now. Um, and uh, all right, so let's move on to the offline discussion now. <laughs>